a girl a running in a group. She had a high speed motor in a 44 coupe. She had a racing cam and a supercharge. Look at Buddy Hot Rod and Large. She's a hot rod. She's a hot rod. But I got to tell you, I've got something here that, well, a little controversial, just a little. But it's true. I didn't make this up. I pulled all that. I've been researching this for a while. And I pulled all this up, and there's a new company in town. There's a new sheriff in town. Is that how that goes? And I'm just going to, I wrote this out so we could talk about this, and I want you to hear this. Because I know I use Takata for stories too often. But, but hey, this time it's all about the auto industry, not just Takata. The auto industry can avoid another killer airbag type debacle if they'll just do what I say, what I'm talking about. Because it's actually entirely preventable. Really, it is entirely preventable. Every parts supplier to the automaking world keeps records of the failure rate on their particular parts on the vehicle, of the vehicle. For warranty reimbursement reasons and a couple other reasons, they do this, see? Many of these suppliers make parts for several makes and models across the board. And that's like Takata, you know, Takata made airbags for how many different cars? They all bought them. But, and they were all failing and they were all bad. But here's what happens. What you probably don't realize is that this information almost never gets shared between car makers because it could potentially ruin a small business, of course. And it did ruin Takata once they caught them. But it was too late, and people had died. People died because they just they didn't share their information, and different different companies, municipalities didn't share their statistics. Well, the car know the car makers know what parts are failing, and they usually get money back from the suppliers when they use when they warranty them. But rarely do they make it public information, even if you know, if, unless of course there's a safety concern. There will, if there's a safety concern, there will most likely not be any kind, unless there's a safety concern, there won't be any kind of recall. Usually a service bulletin to tell them what to do. And I see a lot of service bulletins across the board on different makes and models that all have all these same problems. And then I look it up and it turns out those parts are all made by the same manufacturer. But they don't share their information, these guys. Well, or at the best, you might get a customer satisfaction campaign. But that only gets addressed. Now, remember, a bulletin is something that you have to pay for. That's just to help the technician. A customer satisfaction campaign is something that if you go in and you crab at the uh, bitch at the service manager, and you know, or if you talk really, really nice to him, he may tell you about it, or he may not. If you crab at him, he might not. But the company will pay for it. These are in-house recalls. They're what I call the silent recalls. And they're there. Trust me. Anytime you got a, you got a problem with a car and you hear about friends of yours that have other problems, similar problems, give me a call. Give me a call at 928-CAR-GUYS or call my shop in Lansing at 708-895-9520, and I'll be glad to tell you if there's a customer satisfaction campaign that you should know about. But you know what the deal is? If you, if you don't complain to the service department, they're going to charge you for it. The ultimate loser is the customer driving the car with known crappy parts. Well, here we go. A new company I found in Ann Arbor, Michigan called We Predict Computer Data Program is working to pull back the curtain on parts performance data and provide transparency across corporate lines. This way, if there's seven different companies that have seven different valve problems and all the valves are made by the same company, you will know it. The mechanics that work on your car will know it. The manufacturers will all know it. They don't share that information. Well, we predict is going to share it with the world. Okay? We predict has assembled warranty claim data from a variety of sources, including dealerships and even independent shops, recording chronic problems and part failures. The data goes back 10 years so far with plans to recast and go 15 years of failures. This information is going to be valuable to car makers only if they want to better their end product and build a customer base. 
However, if they just want to keep building their cars and trucks with the cheapest parts that they know will fail eventually, well, we call that planned obsolescence. And you know what? That builds customer base sales too. <laughs> now, if the info is used to tell us the car owners and potential buyers who's using quality stuff and making vehicles that last, we win. We all win. I applaud the company we predict and hope they last in this big money car world. Because guess what? You know how it goes with the big money boys in Detroit. The next thing you know, the next thing you know, we predict will get bought out for a gazillion dollars from somebody. Somebody that wants to keep them quiet. Hey, this is a great start. I think this is how it should be. I see this in my business. I've been doing this for almost 50 years. I've had my own business for 37, and I see it all the time. A Ford, a Chevy, a, a Toyota, a Honda. They, all of a sudden, they, these parts are showing up, and these cars have the same kind of failures. And it turns out the parts are made by the same manufacturer, the supplier. He just makes them for a different company and puts a different stamp on them. Now, if we know that, we can stop this. We can keep getting these crappy parts put on our cars, and we can get better parts. New and bigger, better, faster, as we used to call it. A better mousetrap is what I'm talking about. And this guy, this company we predict, I'm sure it's a young, fledgling company, a bunch of young people with, with computers building a database that could actually straighten up this car world. I probably just rumpled some noses at the, at the, at the studio. I think the suits at the studio, because I got the manufacturers are just, they could have done this. I'm sure that they've been watching. They don't want you to know what's failing and what's not. You, they don't want you to know that they're having trouble with all this, this certain engine. Well, there's certain, certain makers of different timing parts and stuff now that are, we're having nothing but grief with these, these cars, these engines, these V6s with the variable cam timing because they tell people you can go 7,500 miles without changing your oil. <laughs> and you can't. You really and truly can't. All right, well, as long as I'm picking on the car makers and I'm in trouble already, why not go? Let's just jump a little deeper. Guess what year this is? This is the year of the contract talks with the rank and file of the UAW. Oh, yeah. And both sides are gearing up for some hot negotiations. It's going to be a tough one. UA wor UAW workers are still stinging from the concessions they were forced to make back in 2009 during the, in the 10 years and in the 10 years since, have not regained or improved on the automakers or gained or improved on it after this so-called recession. And everybody, all, all the automakers say, well, we got to cut this, we got to cut that. And you're going to have, if you want a job, you got to take a cut and pay, you're going to have to do this. <laughs> well, those days are over. The recession is, <laughs> when I get done telling you all the people that are invested in the car business tonight, you're going to understand that the recession, there's no car recession. The automakers are under are operating under the disguise of restructuring and cutting costs. Did you notice that? Talking about this plant going to cut it down. They might do this. They might do that. They might have to close this plant. And the UAW. While they're doing that, they're actually when do it while they're doing that. They actually are. They have the actually the economy is now producing record profits and huge top brass bonuses. So the big boys are making money. Don't get me wrong. The big car companies have given concessions to the UAW, the workers, over the last 10 years, and some wage increases. But the union feels it's time to bring their workers up to the level prior to the recession of 2009, and they should. On the other side, the UAW rank and file is going to be real hard to ratify any contract, given the recent scandals between their executives of the UAW and the top manufacturing executives in the embezzling money meant for the training for the workers. This is going to be tough. This is going to be a this is going to be a knockdown drag out negotiation time, and I don't blame them. If I was the UAW, I'd be ticked. I would. I'd be just to no end. I'd be mad to no end. Well, there's a lot of good stuff going on around the car world. I I think I picked on the manufacturers enough tonight. And I'm, I'm going to hear about it, but that's all right. Hey, 
I'm telling you like it is. I'm telling you what's going on. You, you deserve to know that. You're the consumer. It's time that the manufacturers and everybody, and the advertisers, it's time they quit hiding the stuff from us, the consumers. If they're having trouble with this kind of thing, let's get it out in the open and let's fix it. Don't hide it. Fix it. That's the way I see it. Okay, the, J, the first J.D. Power brand loyalty study. Who tops the list? Well, it's not good. They're all Asian. Subaru and Lexus are the top two. Foreign auto brands dominated the top spots in the first J.D. Power U.S. automotive brand loyalty study taken this last year. Subaru retained 61.5% of its owners, followed by Toyota at 59.5% of their owners, and Honda at 57.7%. Rounding out the top five, well, yeah, we slipped a couple American made in there. Ram at 56.2%. And Ford at 54%. So the loyalty study, in other words, the people that buy the same car again or same brand again, one after another, well, the Japanese are leading the league. They are. Sorry to, hate, sorry to say. It's just, they are. Here's the story that you've all been waiting for. <laughs> no, you're not. Yeah, maybe you have. I know I can't wait because I just can't stand these cars. The Vol final Volkswagen Beetle is leaving the assembly plant in Mexico after a storied run. Pueblo, Mexico. Since 2012, they have only created and sold 500,000 Beetles. Volkswagen Beetles. They were made and sold. That's the new body style of Beetle. You've seen them around town. They're ugly little devils. Well, the original Beetle, the old Beetle that we remember as, in the, as kids in that from the 60s, originally the first body style Beetle before they quit making it, and then they brought it back to this new body style in 2012. That Beetle sold over 21 million vehicles. 21 million. Hello? At one time, it was a real popular car. It was, a very, it was the hippie car, man. It was the hippy-dippy weather car. <laughs> it was. While we're dealing with Volkswagen, they have decided to drop their last two station wagon models. I don't know anybody that has station wagons, quote, station wagons anymore. I mean, think about it. VW's American dealers will be wagonless for the first time since 1965. When output of the Golf Sport Wagon and Golf All-Track Wagon for the U.S. are discontinued in the U.S. this year. The slow-selling two-wheel and all-wheel drive vehicles, wagons, are victims of the growing crossover sales, which now account for more than half of the VW volume in the U.S. Everybody's buying a crossover. What is the fine line between a crossover and a wagon? You tell me. Because that's what I'm talking about, the actual station wagons. I know, I know people that love station wagons. They just do. And I suppose if you use them for the right stuff, I mean, if you have use for them, station wagon's a good car. If that's what you like, you like. But now you can't buy one anymore. Not that I'm aware of. I think Volvo might still have one. But everybody's gone to the crossover. The small SUV, something in between a station wagon and a big SUV. It's called a crossover. And I said, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know if I, if I think it's right or not. For state, if you have a if you have a job for a station wagon, you should be able to get a station wagon. But I guess they, they all do the same thing anymore. I mean, what's the difference? Well, if you think that the car, the car business isn't booming and they don't have money to throw around, except at the UAW, of course, General Motors is investing $20 million in a Texas plant for the next generation of their SUVs. This investment adds roughly, or too roughly, the $1.4 billion that GM has already invested for the next gen generation SUVs at this plant in Arlington. I think it's Arlington, Texas. Yes, it is. Including a new paint shop and everything they're going to have. GM on Tuesday announced an additional $20 million investment in its Arlington assembly plant to upgrade the conveyors and start production of the redesigned Chevrolet Tahoe Suburban GMC Yukon, Yukon XL, and Cadillac Escalade and Escalade ESV. 
They are cranking them up. They're going to really put some money involved there. There's money flying in Texas is the, the hot spot. Here, again, Texas, again. Toyota prepares to drop $398 million in a Texas investment for their truck upgrades. Texas Motor, Toyota Motor Company, not Texas Motor, Toyota Motor Company is laying the groundwork to invest nearly $400 million into its pickup plant near San Antonio, Texas, to boost efficiencies, production of its modern and modernized or midsize, to modernize the midsize Tacoma and full-size Tundra as part of an ongoing shift to its truck strategy, which is what everybody's doing. Bexar County Commissioners approved a request from the Japanese automaker for a 10-year, 80%, 80% tax abatement for the proposed investment in the 16-year-old Toyota plant. Uh, Texas on body, they call it an on, bot, on frame on body on frame plant. San Antonio Press says. So the, I guess uh, <clears throat> Texas, Texas is the place you want to be. LG Chemical. LG Chemical, a South Korean EV battery maker, electric vehicle battery maker, is weighing an investment of $1.7 billion in the plant that could begin production in 2022 with, it might be either in Kentucky or Tennessee. They are among the candidates for the location. Uh, L, this uh, EG or this LG Chemical, LG Chemical are huge battery suppliers to GM and VW or Volkswagen. They make the batteries for those guys. There's just investment everywhere. Just investment everywhere. You need, <laughs> this car world is really, is booming. I got more investment stories about what's going on around the country, around the world. Ford's investing $788 million for electric, 500, uh, new 500 electric vehicle production. They're going to make $80,000, 80,000 80, units a year, but they're building them in Turin, Italy. Now, where did all these European countries get this infrastructure for the electric cars? You got to tell me. I mean, I, they're, well, I'm hoping they can handle it. I'm hoping we can handle it because there's going to be a lot of electricity flying before the end of this decade. 